All right, guys. I just wanted to show, got a package from Amazon today. I've been waiting on it, and I was hoping I'd get it before I had to leave. This is the spin-on filter for my transmission, for the Allison transmission, and it does come with a new magnet. I ordered one the last time, and uh, I was worried about getting knockoff parts, but it does come in the Allison box. It looks legitimate enough to me. This is the fuel filter, and it does have the AC Delco GM stuff on it. Uh, this here is the oil filter. The box is pretty weathered, but the filter itself looked good. I opened it up, checked it out. So, um, this is the injector connector. I try not to leave home without one. I hope I don't need it, but if I do need it, I want to have it handy. So, I put a number four and a number seven on that truck, and I bought another one and used it on someone else's truck, and, uh, I went ahead and bought this one so I'd have a spare. And these, I did not realize I could get them off Amazon, but if you see what these are, they're the little clips. Well, the different weight distribution setups take different clips, but the ones that I have takes this little, I don't know what you'd call that, but uh, it takes these pins right here. So I'm gonna leave a link to all this stuff. If you have a 2018 Chevrolet Silverado and you want an injector connector that is in the GM packaging. There's a part number if you want to look it up somewhere else. Um, the TP1015 uh, fuel filter for the 2018 Silverado. The Allison 1000 spin on uh, transmission filter. Or the PF2232 oil filter. I'll leave all that in the description where you can get it off Amazon if you want to do it that way. And the reason I get them off Amazon is because I can order them on the road and they're here when I get here. Where I can order them at O'Reilly's and most time they're there when I get here too. But this way I don't even have to go to the parts store. I wasn't home very long this last time and I stayed pretty busy while I was there. We put front and rear pinion seals in this 2004 Dodge along with a oil pan gasket. And then I also rewired a 16 foot trailer that I bought just to tinker with and a lot of other stuff before I headed back to Indiana. All right, here is our 37 foot solitude going to Arroyo Grand, California. I checked the number, I checked the VIN, everything lines up. And I've never really seen one that opened up like this. Somebody dropped a can. Um, one thing I wanted to bring attention to is I had a buddy last night, I had a blowout. And before you leave the yard, one thing you might want look at you see that tool right right there look like a big socket need to know where that's at before you leave if you can find it at all because he got stranded couldn't find that and had to change the tire and like to have never figured out a way to get that tire down so if there's any way possible if you lay eyes on that remember where it's at because if you do have a blowout you'll need that to get the spare tire down now I have not walked all the way around this unit yet. I'm gonna kick the tires and then I'll come back and torque them after I get hooked up because I don't even have my bed cover open yet. Before I ever hook to the trailer, before I ever touch anything, really, I like to check for damages just to make sure. Like I say, I love the old light headlight. It just kind of looks where you do and all that stuff. I believe we're good. I don't see anything out of the ordinary. All the windows are closed, intact, no scratches, no dents and dings, what I can see. So we'll go ahead and get her hooked up and pulled out and look it over again, especially this side. Next thing is make sure we got power. So light lit up, never hit auto level. 
you hit auto level, it will uh, start trying to level itself out. And that's, that's not good. Not when you're trying to hook up. And I can tell from here, we're gonna need to raise it up. That sounds good, battery's nice and hot. I'm gonna raise it up what I think is way too high. That way I'm not um, taking a chance on my toolbox and stuff. Emergency breakaway is missing. That is, uh, that's what was draining, taking the power from the battery whenever I plugged it in. It had to have had one in when it was brought over here because the brakes are locked on it right now without it. Bought these things when I was hauling multiple trailers and there's long ones, there's short ones. That one doesn't fit. So let's try the other one. I can already tell that one over there doesn't fit. Maybe it's this one. Like I said, I bought quite a few of these things because it seems like people always want to run off with them or that one fit. So now the brakes are released. <clears throat> if you pull this out, if this comes unhooked from the truck, that's why the one of the main reasons a battery goes into the connect has to be connected why you have to have a battery when you're transporting because a lot of people ask me well why do you have to have a battery while you're transporting well if this gets pulled out the brakes lock that keeps it from running away and hitting someone going down the road it's always a good idea to keep one of these on hand and i'll replace this one somewhere down the line i'll either um buy a new one when i get there or call them let them know they're like eight bucks it's not a big deal unless you don't have one then it's a very big deal i'm gonna lay it up there so it doesn't get in the way while i'm hooking up i'm gonna continue to look for the one that's supposed to be with this unit and yeah we'll get her hooked up never also never plug your your seven-way plug never plug it in if that thing is out on these newer trucks it can really mess with the trailer braking system um it can blow the views it can short out the actual trailer brake box you know it's just always good to make sure this is plugged in and make sure there's enough length so that when you turn a sharp corner it doesn't get pulled out I'm gonna check that as we get going after I pull it out of here and make sure that it's not gonna pull tight enough to, that it would pull it out of that. Always check the pin. Make sure those jaws are locked good around that pin after the handle is in a locked position. Can't stress that enough. And now that we're done with that, there's my battery box. I'm gonna let it ride right there. I think it'll be fine. I've let them ride right there before. You don't have to worry about turning the uh, controller off. It'll time out and cut off automatically. And oh, that's closed. All the lights appear to be on. I'm going to pull it out. Always make sure and check your little caps there too to make sure they're on.
We'll check the lights on the back, but you really can't do anything with it. If I do like when they've got backup lights. Although, if you do get into a position to back where you need to back up, believe it or not, those three or four little LEDs right there really do help. It looks like all the lights are burning on it. I'm where you got my signs, tag, all that stuff. All I got left is torque the wheel or torque the lug nuts and uh, walk down that side for damages. And like I say, I want to find where the the winch or whatever you call it is for the spare tire. So if I were to happen to have a blowout like my buddy did last night, I will be able to get it taken care of in a timely fashion. I don't know where everything's at. I can go right to it and get it taken care of and I won't have to stumble around on the road looking for it. That's something that's in my pre-trip from now on that I've thought about it before, but I never really stressed it before. First thing I'm gonna do is check my brakes. They are working. I'm gonna pull against it. Huh, they're actually working, working, but pull straight forward. I have more room to my left than I do to my right, which would probably be backwards for you guys because you're looking at me from the front but I'm not gonna turn until the last minute so that that trailer has enough room to get out of the way of the trailer beside of it so you don't swing the tail end into that trailer beside of it. So I went ahead and walked on around and checked all my lights, void working, everything working. I went ahead and torqued the lug nuts on the tires and kicked them all, made sure it was up even the ones that tight that I couldn't squeeze into earlier. And I do believe we're ready to go. We're not going far tonight. That's for sure. Yeah. It looks good. Yep. Here she is in daylight. I just woke up here and uh, hit the loves and ghost. Walked around, got everything checked out, got all my doors locked. These things mess with my head a little bit sometimes. They look like they're, when you come up and actually look, they look like they can be open. Some of them just got different gaps than others. But, I believe it's fine. I checked my cable last night. It's got plenty of room for sharp turns. I don't want to pull that out. to see there. I got the stick and I cut a notch in the end of it so I could reach down in there and turn that valve. Ah, uh, sorry about the wind noise but I'm here in Joplin, Missouri and I forgot all about it. It slipped my mind the other night but this is the hole for the, for the jack to go in the winch handle to let the spare tire down from under the trailers. There are two other trailers here in the parking lot and both of theirs are in the same spot. The little white hawk over there and there's an Imagine right there. They're all in the same spot. So I'm gonna be watching for it on the different trailers that I pulled. So I got my tag on. Went around, checked everything out and I think it's about, about good to get on down the road. Getting a late start, but it's okay. So yesterday I'm driving along and the check engine light pops back up. Um, I'd seen a code come and go on it. The light had came on and went off on its own a couple of times and what it wound up being was a P249D and then the other code that came was a P11DC and it stayed for quite a while yesterday and then last night I cleared the codes just to see what would happen and this one came back, the other one didn't. What the P11DC references, the position, the uh, position two knock sensor. The bank one sensor two knock sensor. So when I get unloaded in a Royal Grand, I don't think I'm gonna have any problem with it trying to limit my speed or anything like that. And if I do, then I'll handle it at that time. But I think when I get finished at Oral Grand, I'm gonna come back to Kingman and go to the dealership there. I'm gonna call them on the way out, make sure they have one, and go ahead and pick up a, 
uh, position two knot sensor. I changed the first one at 200 and around 225. I've got a video on it. It's around, I think it was around 225,000. And it was giving me the 249D and I don't remember the other code, but it referenced the number one, position one uh, knock sensor. So that, uh, I replaced that one and I want to say it's 30,000 miles, 30, 40,000 miles. I didn't have any more lights on the dash. So I'm hoping I get that lucky again, replace the number two, no more lights on the dash. I, that's what I'm hoping for. But I do know that I've gotten a couple of codes talking about uh, the DPF, low flow DPF in, with the DPF filter. So I'm feeling pretty sure that it's getting time to start looking into replacing the filter or something more drastic. But anyway, that's how my morning's starting off. I went in and got my shower and got something to eat here at Joplin. And uh, I plan on trying to make it to I'm making it in New Mexico. I really am not going to not going to uh, try to think too much into it. I would like to get to Milan, New Mexico. It may be a little bit too far. So, for about the past two to three hours, I have been noticing a misfire where it um just a intermittent miss and with my experience the injector connectors that's how they go and uh, I've had a code the P11DC and the P249D and I'm pretty sure that, that is the position to knock sensor then it went bad and I figured I would get that taken care of when I got unloaded and now I have a P0205. So, at least I am right here where I was planning on stopping for the night and in a safe spot. It actually, the light came on three miles from the truck stop I was trying to get to. Actually, getting off the exit now. So, get up in the morning and get this figured out. Okay, so I got into a parking spot and plug, plugged in and this is my first attempt to read the codes. I've already read them with the auto sync, but I haven't read them with the auto. One of the codes I understand, it's a P0205. P0305. I've not seen that one yet. The not sensor to current performance. I kind of already knew what that was. And yeah, with it saying circuit A, cylinder five injector circuit A, I feel fairly confident that that's an injector connector and I have one of those with me. I'm not going to mess with it tonight. I will go ahead and crash. Luckily, it's not scorching hot out here tonight. So, I can bundle up and make that work. So, I'm just sitting here thinking. I don't know how well the lighting is in here or anything. I normally don't do videos after dark. Um, but I've been getting a lot of, you know, conversations on Snapchat, on Instagram, comments. One that somebody asked me the other day, you know, what's the best part of the job? The best part of this job is being your own boss. And I'm holding the phone if it's shaking, I'm sorry. But uh, being your own boss, getting to call your own hours and take loads 
you want to take, going to places you want to go and all that stuff if it's available. And then the worst part of the job. I feel fairly confident, you know, that I've already done the number seven injector connector and it's the same, pretty much the same code, same symptoms, same everything as that. If it's not the connector, I feel even more secure, more confident that it will be the injector itself. You know, but I'm not a mechanic. That's why I say it's very important to get to know your vehicle because where I'm sitting tonight, I don't know if there's a dealership around. I don't know if there's a shop around that's, you know, trustable. I don't know any of that stuff. The worst part of the job is this right here. Work all day and then have an issue at the end of the day. And if you've not done this or know, know the working knowledge of your truck, you're at the mercy of the tow truck, at the mercy of the mechanic or the shop that you go into you're literally at the mercy of whatever gets thrown at you. That is the worst part of this job. Luckily, I have a friend that's delivering in California tomorrow, tomorrow, and headed back this way. So I may get him to stop in Kingman and pick up the knock sensor and meet me. If I need an injector, I can get him to stop and pick that up, hopefully, somewhere between there and here. But it's not a good feeling you know 35 degrees outside i do have that's why everything kind of shaky because i do have the truck running right now getting the heater warmed up i'm not gonna let it run all night be the first night i haven't let it run all night in a long time um and people ask me i see people comment a lot back and forth on facebook uh don't let the truck idle while you're sleeping it'll you know it's hard on the emissions 308,000 miles, 9,100 hours. That's not bragging, that's just me stating what I've done with this truck. I've replaced, this will be my third injector connector. I've done number seven, number four, this will be number five. And a def injector and the number one knock sensor. And that is the only issue that I can remember having out of this truck so far in 300,000 miles. And with me doing the work myself, all that all in is less than $1,500 worth of maintenance in two years, or repairs in two years, and uh, 308,000 miles. I don't feel like that's that bad myself. But if I had to take it to a shop for this issue, you know, if I had all had to pay the shop for all three, that would be more than the $1,500 that I've spent maintenance on. So yeah definitely the worst part of it because if it was an issue where the truck wouldn't run at all it's 35 degrees it's winter it's not even winter yet you know so if it was 13 degrees or three degrees you know my neighbors whenever i ordered this jacket they asked me why do you need a heated jacket because in a situation like this it doubles as an electric blanket i have been stuck in an 18 in the 18 wheeler one night I sheared the input shaft off the fuel pump on the 18-wheeler and I was pulling the fuel pump off and I got over an inch of snow on my shoulders while I was doing it. It was 18 degrees outside, about froze to death. Truck didn't run all night. It was miserable. After that, I went off, got the big thick sleeping bag. I do have an electric blanket. The jacket's expensive, but after you get stuck, hung out, with a truck that doesn't run in extreme old cold temperatures, it, to me, it's gonna be worth it. You know, this is probably the third time I put it on, but I like knowing I have it. Anyway, I was about to go to bed and I just, that hit me that I should throw that into the video. This is the worst part of this job. When you have a breakdown, when you're 12, 1300 miles from home and have that breakdown, um, if you ever get damages, nobody wants or plans to get damages, but when you do get damages, if you do get damages, that's another bad thing. A friend of mine another night had a blowout on a brand new trailer. I think I told you about that in the front first of the video. Luckily it was no damages, but changing that tire on the side of the road in the middle of the night by itself, 
not knowing where the tool was to get the jack down and all that, the tire down and all that stuff. Yeah, that's, you know, those are the bad parts. But on that, not, on that note, I'm going to get some sleep. I'm going to try to get up fairly early in the morning and get the fender liner out. And luckily, luckily, this is a number five. Number five, you don't have to mess with the EGR stuff. Is fairly somewhat easy easy to get to the video I did on the number seven where it exposed two connectors and number seven the other was a number five so I've been in there before I just really hope that that fixes this issue this issue and the knock sensor fixes the other but I'm not a mechanic I'm just going by the scan tool and hoping for the best you know well about five minutes in and this is, zoom in, this is what I'm hoping is the culprit, this plug right here. Oops, there we go. You know, it's crazy. I'm doing this a few times. There's the last one that I did. Actually, the first one that I ever did is right here. It seems to still be holding up fine. And then this is number five. And uh, it's crazy how much faster this gets with time. Five minutes later, I'm looking at it. So I'm gonna take and unplug this, cut these wires about right here, and uh, throw this connector away, put the new connector on. I've, I've made a couple of videos on this, so I'm not gonna bore you with all of it, but on the passenger side, it's one, three, five, seven. This is number seven, that's the first one I did. The video is on here. I'll try to put a card to it up in the corner. And then this would be your number five. So we'll get that changed out and I'll show you what it looks like. All right, so I always like to show a picture of the part and the part number and I'm leaving a link for this in the description as well. I've been ordering these off Amazon. I've not had one off Amazon fail yet. Number seven is from the dealer, number four is from Amazon. Now number five will be from Amazon. And you see what I've done there. Unplug the connector, cut the connector off, strip the wires back, and uh, yeah. So now I will plug in the new connector, see how much wire I need to trim off of the new one. I can't stress enough when you're putting these on, they're kind of hard to get at, but always do a really good tug test when you get done. The first one didn't crimp good, and I pulled on it and it came right loose and I had to redo it. I always pull on it pretty good. So it's not as pretty as I'd like for it to be and I will try to wiggle it around and get it laid down a little bit better. But there it is. All right, so I went ahead and put my window shade back up so maybe we can see a little better. And it's still the same stuff from last night. I do have the scan tool. Um, up and running let's see what it says diagnostics LBD. auto scan DTCs. Now, I do not expect this to completely cut the check engine light off because I know I still have a knock sensor issue and I'm going to replace that on the way back. Um, I may try to stop and pick it up on my way, but I'll definitely replace it on the way back. So, there's the codes, the 249D and the 305, 205, 305-249D. The 305 and 205 is related to the injector connector that I just replaced. The 20EE and 249D, those are related to the knock sensor. So what happens? I say I'm not looking for the check engine light to go away, just hopefully all of the emission system stuff will go away. Running smooth again.
the egg coolant comes on too on a regular basis that's a general thing that's wrong with these trucks every one of them i know has a, a low coolant light that comes on whenever the uh um whenever the trucks first started i didn't expect the check engine light to go off let's go ahead and cut it back off because i know a lot of people frown about clearing codes while the truck's running i have done it but it is what it is clear dtc's Yes. And the 300 is still there. It's marked as permanent, so I had to cycle the ignition a few times before it goes away. Injector 5 circuit A is still there. It's marked as permanent. But the rest of them that were there are gone. I'm going to go ahead and hit clear again. Start it up or, or let it finish that and then I'll start it up. kind of hard to tell check engine light is off just because I just cleared it it's kind of hard to tell without putting it under a load if it's still missing or not no that was smooth there's nothing wrong with that so I'm gonna go ahead and cycle the ignition off and on one more time I do believe the check engine light will come back on because of the um, knock knock sensor codes, and it did well. Ice possible dry would care. Like I say, it is 33 degrees up. So it's kind of got dark on me, but I wanted to kind of give an update. I made it across to Keeman to the Petro truck. Did great. Um, the check engine light still on for the codes having to do with the knock sensor, but all the permanent codes for the injector connector went away. That was a good thing. And uh, got here, I've still got seven hours to go to I deliver, and um, not a uh, not sure if I'm gonna stay here for the night or if I'm just gonna stay here for a few more minutes and then take off. I'm gonna go in and get something to eat and possibly go on into California not really sure i've got plenty of time i don't know i just be a long drive back tomorrow if i don't get a little bit further tonight so um i didn't forget about veterans day if you're a veteran we appreciate your service we appreciate your sacrifice thank you for all you do um but i'm going to roll in here and get something to eat and i will let you know, guys know how things are going tomorrow. All right, so here's the damage. I know it's even kind of hard to see unless you get just right on it. Right there from, looks like somebody took their finger and just creased it from right there to right there. Come back a little bit more right here to right here so yeah that makes me sick of the dog but I'm so thankful it didn't get the window but then me being me I went ahead and told him as soon as I pulled in you know I didn't want him seeing a spot on the truck and not seeing and then finding something on the camper so I wanted to make sure I told him up front and Kind of hard to see with the sun in their eyes, but believe it or not, it didn't even put, it didn't even scuff the paint. So they come out and checked it out after I told them, and I understand most people wouldn't have told them about that, but uh, I just wanted to be honest with them about it. I like coming here. 
they're good guys. Trailer Hitch RV in their Royal Grand California. And like I said, just want to make sure I slept better tonight. And with the bugs and all the stuff that gets matted up on the front, you can never tell what they're going to find underneath. And I was just trying to be honest about it, even though I'm sure a bunch of you are sitting there shaking your head right now. But like I said, I'm still very aggravated about this. And they asked me that I want them to, you know, was there anything they could do to help me when I get the insurance to fix this? I said, no, that's going to stay. That's going to be a painful reminder to me that stuff happens. You know, no matter how close you're paying attention, pay more attention. It's not if something's going to happen, it's when something's going to happen. Truck's got 309,000 miles on it, and that's the first ding that I put on it. So. No wonder this joker was heavy. Same heavy. She got three slide outs, but it didn't have the generator in it. But that's why they want you to leave the battery hooked up so they can run all this stuff in and out and make sure it all works correctly. That sounds horrible. And there's one more slide out. Yeah, so I had uh, four slide outs and an awning, two awnings. All right, so I'm sure I never covered exactly how I bumped the trailer into the truck, and I'm sure, yeah. So how did I bump the trailer into the truck? I made it from Kingman over to uh, Moan, California to Love's. Pulled in, I normally go around, normally where the trucks park, that place stays, I've never seen it full. So I pulled in and I was going around to the truck parking and the guy in front of me, he stopped. And I went to turn, I had to back up. I don't know what he was doing, he wasn't in a bad spot, I'm not saying he's blocking up the parking lot. Um, but whenever I backed up and I went to go around him, when I was going to go around him, there was another truck easing out. and versus there was plenty of room for me and plenty of time and room for me to go on out and around so that's what i did and i was watching what i was doing a smart alex apparently not close enough yeah i get that um but i'd already drug that trailer 1500 miles i swear i'd turn sharper than that with it and never got close but as i was turning I was watching my tail swing on the other side to make sure I wasn't going to swing into anything. I was watching other stuff around me. I was watching to make sure I had enough room to clear him. You know, if you're thinking about getting into this, there's there's a lot of a lot to watch. You know, especially when the, that's to me that's the most aggravating times when you first hooked up and you're trying to get around the lots because right now they're full. You know, trying not to bump anything getting out and Trying to find parking, doesn't matter where. Truck stops, it, you know, anywhere. Um, rest areas, just wherever there, there's usually, there's so many trucks, can, uh, RV transporters, transporters in general that transport like the UPS vans and the FedEx vans and all that stuff. There's so many people transporting and commercial hauling right now of whatever sorts that there's not enough parking, you know? So, when I got off at the Loves, I saw that there were like four parking spots in a row. So I knew I would have a good place to park back off out in the back. And most of the people nowadays, they don't, they don't park in parking spots anymore. I mean, that's that's ridiculous. Just pull out anywhere. So there were trucks parked all up and down the edges, you know, around the curbs. But like I said, they weren't in the way. I'm not blaming that on anyone else. I'm just saying I had some really good prime real estate back there to park on. <laughs> and I made a mistake. I cut too sharp. I caught it. As I was turning, I was looking, and the thought went through my head is I, I have plenty of room, not, oh my gosh, I'm getting close. And 
I don't know. Stuff happens. If you do this long enough, something's gonna happen. I, I've known that ever since the first day I started trucking, driving a big truck, you know, much less pulling campers and hauling oversized, all the experience I have. It, it's not if something happens, it's when it happens. And the, you just you just have to hope that when it does happen, it's not bad. I'm very thankful. You know, I, I've been really irritable this week. I have, I don't know if it showed up in my videos or not. If it did, I apologize, but I'm still irritable. I'm just trying to perk up. But uh, the injector connector going down, I had the part in my pocket. I knew how to fix it. It got me off the side of the road. That was a good day, you know? Stuff happens. 300,000 miles, 310,000 miles out of the truck and no more than what I've done to it. I think I said everything I've done to it earlier in the video. That's nothing. I know people who have been through heck and back with their trucks and not even got 125, 150,000 miles on them yet. I also know people, and I'm not calling out Chevy, Ford, and Dodge, and if you do, then you're not very smart about it because they all give issues. You know, you pick what you're comfortable in and what you like, you know. Um, I, I, I mean, I can give you names and references of people who have, if you're a Dodge man, someone who has a Ford that's outdone the Dodge or someone who's had a Dodge that has not had very good luck out of it. And other, the Chevrolet guy who's got a Dodge buddy who's kicking his butt, you know I mean? It's just, it depends on the truck you get and how it was maintained before you had it. The people, you know, how it came down the assembly line. I, I believe it just depends on a lot of stuff. You either get a good one or you don't. Um, so, you know, I, and the, one of the reasons I kind of stressed on that so hard right now is because I get that question so much. What's the best truck for this? Pick what you're comfortable in. If you're comfortable in a Chevy, get a Chevy. I am, you know, that's, I test drove a Dodge before and I don't have anything against Dodge. I, mean, I, I love a Cummins engine. Uh, just, it's just not for me. Um, I drove a Ford before I bought this truck. Wasn't for me, you know. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of you guys watching who drove a Chevrolet and said, it's not for me, you know. Either way you want to look at it, you're going to be making a payment on a truck for a while, unless you go pay for it cash, and either way, it's yours when you buy it. Um, make sure you get something you like. Don't buy something that you don't like and you don't want, because if you do and you have a bad experience, if that truck goes down and sits in the shop and all that stuff, instead of looking at a truck, I mean, it, it, it's really a mind thing when you look at that truck and it's sitting there and it's not what you even wanted in the first place, it's a lot harder to make that payment and come up with the money to get it out of the shop than it is if it's something that you're really comfortable in and you're really glad that you bought, you just want it back on the road. That's been my experience and my experience seeing other people with that experience. But hopefully, you know, hopefully everybody's truck rides forever and doesn't give any issues, but it doesn't work like that. Um, I'm gonna get into some questions that I've gotten from people you know, I don't have a lot of them written down. I'm sorry, I just went off memory and jotted down the few that I could find. <coughs> uh, 2,500 to 3,500. These are my opinions and what I know based on the experience. I, I've only been doing this for two years, going on two years, and I have a 2500. I bought it for another purpose. I didn't buy it to haul camper haul RVs with. Um, if I had it to go over again, I would hate to think. I'm sure a long wheelbase rides better. So if I'd have got a three quarter ton long wheelbase, I'm sure that would ride better. If I would have got a three quarter ton or a single wheel 3500, I'm sure that that could have been better. I mean, but I'm happy with this truck. It has done me an exceptionally well job. Um, the airbags have been awesome. I wouldn't know that I would want this truck without the airbags, but I would. I would just need something to help the suspension out. Um, so, yeah. The best of my understandings of it is if you have me trying to tell you this on camera, if we're sitting here in person, I could probably do it a little bit better, but I'm going to do my best. To the best of my knowledge and i could be dead wrong if i am that's what i'm that's what the comments are for just if i'm dead wrong 
and I miss say something or I say something that's inaccurate, I'm not promising you that I'm correct. I'm just telling you what I heard from the safety men at two different companies and when I leased on and um, with my experience of trucking in general, all that mixed together, you know, and knowing people who are non-CDL and CDL and all that jazz. So, if you are non-CDL, if you want to be versatile, you need to be light. Um, the lighter your your GBWR is, the more weight you you can haul without going over twenty six thousand pounds. Because without a CDL, to the best of my understanding, your GBWR on the truck, which on this one is ninety nine hundred or right at ten thousand, um, technically. And I know a lot of you guys are sitting here finna call me on this, and I'm I understand. But I'll get to it in a minute. Uh, technically, that's the 26,000. I can go uh, 16,000 pound trailer without going GVWR, without going over with a three quarter ton truck, non CDL. Okay. With me having a CDL, 10,000 pound truck um, with a weight, this is a healthy chick. She weighs a lot um, because of all the extra stuff I put on it. And I will be 100% as honest as I can be without saying anything I don't want to say. I don't, there's some of the rules rules about this stuff that I don't understand. Some of the stuff that I would get in trouble for in an 18 wheeler is A-OK -okay doing this and some of the stuff that's A-OK -okay doing this is, you know, there's some stuff I just can't wrap my mind around and I've asked a lot of people and they can't explain it to me either. So. Being, an, being that I have a CDL and a, 30, and a 2500 that weighs in, um, it's right around 9,500 pounds. So about 16.5 rolling weight. If you have a CDL, they go by the actual weight going across the scale. Non-CDL goes by GBWR. Um, so the way that I've been doing it, as long as the weight of the trailer, like the big triaxle toy haulers that you've seen me pull in the videos, I could not pull those if this was a long wheelbase one ton, 3,500. That would put me over. I went through the Arizona scale not long ago and I had uh, one of the big, we'll say it was a voltage triaxle toy hauler. And they've never asked me to go across the scale before unless I went across it coming in. And this time we just pulled right straight over to the parking lot and the lady inside said, you're gonna have to go across scale. And I said, why? She said, you're over 26,000 pounds. I said, no ma'am. She said, you are. I said, okay. But I got $100 in my pocket that says $100 each if y'all wanna take that bet that I'm not over 26,000. She said, just pull on the scale. Okay, just trying to make some money. I go out, pull around the scale and she made me go across the scale twice. I pulled around to the front and can't or pulled pull back over and I came back in. I said, so what was it? I was 24,000, 20, 24,900 pounds. So I was closer than I probably should have been, but I made sure that my fuel tanks were low. I made sure, and, I, I felt like I was okay. I've scaled a few of these units just to see what they do weigh. And there have been a couple that I was 2650, 26100. When I'm 26100 with a full tank of fuel, I can run lower on my auxiliary tank and lose that at eight pounds a gallon. I can lose that 100, pound, that 100 pounds that I'm over. Anyway, the questions, there's other questions that I'm not real comfortable answering on camera because I don't really understand. Now, that's the 2500, 3500 conversation. The 3500 long wheelbase is gonna be better all day, every day because it is a heavier truck with four tires in the back and all that. Yes, I agree 100%. But if you're sitting in Indiana and there's not a load to be had and you live in Arizona and you can all they've got is stuff going northeast or straight south or whatever and that one load comes up that is too heavy for you to pull with that one ton especially if you're a non-cdo really it doesn't matter 
than if you were in a three-quarter ton, a, light, a lighter truck, you could ease across the scale and be under 26,000 pounds. That's all I'm saying, you know. And that's the best of my understanding. If I'm wrong, you guys hash it out in the comments. I mean, I, what I've been doing for two years worked pretty good for me. Until somebody else tells me different, that's how I'm gonna continue to do, you know. And if you look around, I'm not the only one doing it. So I feel like I'm, I'm pretty confident in what I'm saying. There's two things I'm not really gonna get into. Instagram and Snapchat have kind of been getting a lot of, yeah, a lot going on, and I don't mind. I'll answer any questions that I have. If you want to know the two things that worry me, you're welcome to hit me up there. But I'll say this: if you don't have Snapchat and Instagram, don't. I wouldn't worry about it because it's not been an issue. You know, I'm just not wanting to get way into it on YouTube. Um. I hope that was good uh, as far as why I would go back and buy another short wheelbase three quarter ton truck. I've already got comfortable with this one and I think it's efficient. I think it's doing a fine job, you know. Now if if, I, if we didn't have to worry about weights and all that stuff, would I, would, would I go with a one ton? Probably, possibly. After this one completely burns and plays out, yeah, maybe. But next thing, does the battery charge wire video that I've, I've uh, made a couple of videos on that. The, <laughs> I know I made two. I made the first one and in all honesty, if I look at it, I, when I looked at it a long time ago, it didn't seem like it had a lot of views and all that stuff. And it didn't look like it had a lot of interaction. And I didn't realize that you guys had saw it and already took away what you're gonna take away from it. But in the same note, I think the battery tester is a really good idea. And I, yeah, I thought that would be something I'd show you guys. And also, if you buy those things, places I've seen them where you can buy them without the test lights are $35. Um, when I was making them up with the test lights, people were offering me $50. If you get online and well, I don't care where you buy the stuff. If you go to O'Reilly's, the, just the, the seven way is over 20 bucks. But if you get, if you get the stuff, you can shop around and get the stuff to make it for 20, $25 for all of it, you know? And now will it overcharge? I don't see how I've been using it since when I was at the other company, we pulled mainly, uh, horse trailers, which had their own batteries and also, um, cargo trailers which you didn't have to have a battery for at all <clears throat> they had the little small battery for the breakaway and what i was running into is my battery was sitting in the back of the truck and it would just sit there and sit there and sit there and then by the time i would need it it would be weak i worked there for almost a year i pulled like four campers and the rest of it was four trailers and stuff that i did not have to have a battery to go on so a lot of times by the time i needed my battery especially with the cold snaps and all that stuff it would be really weak or dead and that's why i decided to that or you'd when you're hooking up something would be off of that trailer you blow the charge fuse and you wouldn't ever know it until you got to the other end to unload the camper push the button the battery's dead you know so after a time or two with a dead battery and watching people sitting out with their hoods up and jumper cables on their battery trying to charge the battery enough up enough to get the landing gear up i figured i would make a charge wire i bought my first one at dan's and elkhart i want to say it's 35 right around 35 dollars I drove off and left it sitting in a trailer in California. Now, after that, instead of on my way back across, I went into, I think, a Napa somewhere and I bought the plug, I bought the wire, I bought everything that I needed to make one for about the same as what I gave, $25, $30. Then I had that one for a long time and I gave it away. And I did drive off and leave another one. I know it's bad um because if you get used to not using a battery anyway another story so then i found the led lights i really like that because it does have the tester on it so if you plug into your camper your backup lights let's say you want to know if your backup lights are working if you plug that thing in and this is something i've talked to more than a few people that didn't know i love it when the camper has backup lights on it i try not to ever put the truck in reverse but that's not going to happen i mean you're going to have to back up it sometimes 
So when it's if it's dark, especially on my gooseneck at home, different trailers, I just really like it when I put it in reverse and I can see behind my trailer. You know, and they're not bright. They're only three or four little LEDs, but it's enough to help if you're in the right situation. Gives me peace of mind knowing they're back there if I have to use them versus them not being back there. Um, so that tester will test your backup. And I've talked to multiple people that say, well, the backup lights on my truck are working. They should be working on the camper. And they should be, but you have a separate backup fuse under the hood. So if you get a camper and it's got the clear lights on the back, you put it in reverse, those lights don't come on, check your fuse. You know, get the little thing out and look and see what fuse goes to your trailer backup. Um, that's that's an, another point that I wanted to make. And as far as does the battery overcharge, some vehicles have one battery in them. Some vehicles have two batteries in them. The third battery in the back being plugged in, mine is plugged in right now and it won't come unplugged until I hook to another camper, whether it's 10 hours or 10 months, you know? And I have noticed that there was one time in particular that there's a reason for it. I left my ignition on for the doors locked and uh, I forgot my truck stayed with the ignition on for nearly two days at home. I was driving my car, I didn't think nothing about it. And uh, I'll tell you, I'm gone so much, I don't need home internet. I do have a $25 unlimited plan on this truck. When I get home, I pull it right up in my front door, leave the ignition on, I can run my smart TV, my home computer, I can run everything in the house from the truck. That's what I was doing with it. And I left the ignition on for two days. And I thought, oh my gosh, the battery's bound to be dead. So I go out and the truck started, but all three batteries were weak. I honestly believe if it wouldn't have been for the battery in the back of the truck, back feeding through the system, that it would have killed them all. It, I would have had a dead battery. Either way you look at it, when the battery voltage drops, the alternator kicks in. When the battery voltage always comes back up, it kicks back out. You know, some trucks have one battery, some trucks have two batteries. When mine is plugged in, it kind of is like having three batteries, but it won't try to crank off of that battery. So anyway, if someone can tell me an instance where it's hurt something, put it in the comments. This has been going on for, I've been using this like this for a year and a half. Sometimes it stays plugged up for a month at a time. Never had a problem. The only time I've had to replace my battery is when I drove off and left it. And that's the problem. How do I stay warm in the winter time, cool in the summertime? I idle the truck. In the 18 wheeler, I always idle the truck in mine. I didn't when I was driving for company driver, when I was a company driver back in the early days, but I did from the time I bought my truck on. When I go home, it takes me like two days to get adjusted to sleep in a, sleep in a bed that's not vibrating or rattling. You know, um, hearing all the truck stop noise and all that stuff. When I go home and it's pitch quiet, you can't feel the truck running and you can't, I have a hard time sleeping. So do I feel like it's harder on the engine? Of course it is. You're running, you know, every engine that's built has only got so many miles left in it if it's maintained properly and all that. And you're taking away from that life of that engine. So I understand that. I get that. I'm not recommending anybody else do it. But me personally, if you see my truck sitting out nine minutes, it's running and it's going to be. Uh, as far as the temperatures and all that stuff. This truck, if it gets under a certain temperature, it auto automatically idles itself up. Um, I did a video showing how to idle your truck up if it's super cold and, you know. But here, here's the thing, if it's four degrees outside, do you know how many people I've jumped off that it was four degrees outside, they tried to save fuel. So they bundled up in a sleeping bag and put their electric blanket on and did all this stuff trying to stay warm, woke up next morning with dead batteries. So now, the bill for someone to come out and jump them off has actually ate up way more than fuel. I've heard some people say the wear and tear and maintenance on the truck from running all the time is actually uh, doing more damage than the, the, you know, you're spending more money than actually getting a hotel room every night and being comfortable. The comfort thing, I get that. I'm a big boy, you know, I get that. But. I've already told you guys what I've done maintenance wise on this truck, 310,000 miles, 9,320 hours on it in like 27 months. Am I bragging? No, that's not good. But at the same time, am I going to start cutting my truck off tomorrow? No, I'm not. Uh, when it's hot in the summertime, I got to be cool to sleep. I don't have any more 
room for extra weight. I'm not gonna put another put a generator on here. I don't have room for it. I'm not gonna put heaters in here. I mean, you could look around in here. There's no room for anything else. So, this is my option. This is what. This is how I'm gonna do it. And if you guys can afford a zoom room to go up on top of your truck with a generator underneath the truck, so you you don't have to worry about that, more power to you. I'm you know I'm I'm really happy about that. But that's no, I don't have it like that. So, um, I do know people who have had way more issues out of their Chevrolets, GMCs, Dodges, and Fords than I have, and they don't idle. So there's another thing. On that note, I really wish that I had done the PCV reroute a long time ago, but I still haven't done it today. So any blow by that this engine has got on it at 310,000 miles, that's something to look into as a PCV reroute. I think it is a very, very good thing. Um, you take the PCV line that feeds back into the intake, you take that off and you route it into a catch can and it catches any blow by that comes out. Um, instead of pumping that blow by back in through the turbo, then it goes around through the intercooler and all through the internal parts of the engine. That's, that's horrible and I haven't done it yet. I mean, that's just a little something that I feel like is a tip. Uh, so that's how do I stay warm and cool. The next thing, can you, can I make money? I get that question all the time and I really wished I had a solid, solid answer for you guys, but the best thing that I can do is put out, I don't know how to be more transparent with the money and there's something about the money I'm gonna get to in a minute too. Um, well, I'll get to it now, I guess, with the money. The last overall grand load I took out, the load paid $1.81 a mile. It paid $4,155 gross before anything comes out. Of that, I spent $954, we'll call it $955 in fuel. So after my fuel, before my truck payment maintenance, anything else, you know, I don't remember you can do the math on that. It was right, right at uh, thirty-one, three thousand, thirty-one hundred dollars, something like that. Now, I probably should have figured it up before I started making a video, but I didn't. Now, this trip with the fuel going up like it has, uh, the same trip, nothing really was different. Now the injector connector went down, but I didn't try to drive it no long. It didn't use an excessive amount of fuel because of that. And as a matter of fact, when the injector connector was down, I didn't idle the truck that night. There was another night that I didn't idle the truck just because, you know, if it's a wonderful night out and there, there are times that I don't, but 90%, 99% of the time I do. And I was actually looking to save money on fuel is why I turned that off, why I didn't run it the second night. So um, if you're in California, if you're in one of the higher priced states, and you know that you can get back, but you know you're gonna burn X amount of gallons idling overnight, then I'll cut the truck off before I'll spend that extra 50 cents a gallon to fuel up. So anyway, this trip with a fuel price increase, I spent 1230 some odd dollars, 1232 I think was what the number came up to. So I lost an additional 200 and We'll call it 200, 225 if that's what it was. It's a little more than 225 but let's say that. If the fuel prices keep going up and the rates don't come up to compensate, it's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt pretty bad. So, that being said, I, I've heard a lot of people say that there's supposed to be a rate increase. I don't know how much it's gonna be. I know in all my years of trucking, it's never been enough, you know? And about the time it gets about right, you know, the fuel goes up, then the rates start trickling up, and about time the rates are starting to get to where they actually cover the increase in fuel, because that's what we're looking for. You know, if we were doing the job for this this price one day, and then the cost of fuel goes up, you know, if you're not if it's not if it's not completely covering the cost, you're still losing money. So about time. It gets up to where it's comparable with what you're spending in fuel. 
the fuel price will drop back down a little bit and the rate the um the rate increase goes it starts dropping drastically it takes it forever to come up but it drops off in a split second if you feel like i do like the like the fuel prices are going to keep going up and you're looking at getting into this hold off just a little bit longer especially if you have a good thing going now that will drastically affect how much money you're going to make uh, another thing i had a gentleman was messaging me if you have medical insurance through your current employer you have to figure that in now i don't have medical insurance the reason i don't have medical insurance is because the only plans that i found are horrible and they're overpriced when somebody presents me a plan that is not that will actually cover what cover something if it happens other than catastrophic failure i'm not going to live through anyway you know I, I, I will be very happy to look into that but as long as the insurance plan are just basically robbing me i'm not going to have insurance you know i hate that i would love to have insurance i mean i paid a lot of stuff out of pocket that i wished i'd have had some help on but uh i could go deeper into that when i'm not going to um if you've got retirement you won't have retirement as a as a independent contractor now if you are like ex-military where you have benefits to, to the military that's not really going to change anything you're going to lose by leaving your current employer you have to fit, figure buying that back in you know um home time if you have a family and you need to be home i mean i don't really i like being home i love being home but i don't have to be home so that's why i stay out three weeks to a month two i may stay out one week i may stay out six weeks who knows it just all depends on how much i want to make before i go home and how long i want to stay on the next time i go if i want to take three weeks off i stay out a month you know six weeks and then i can afford to go on and take a little more time off but if you know you see where i'm going with that um if you have a family and you need to be home friday afternoon and can't leave until monday morning that's mostly going to depend on your geographic location um you know if i lived in uh amarillo well and i went up and picked up in california i would be going straight up coming straight, i'd be home every couple of days you know but if you live in alabama or alabama around the alabama tennessee line if you live right on the alabama tennessee line and you want to do that this is the way you want to run the way that i feel i make the most money you're not you're not going to be able to get home as much um and if you do, I could run one of these and go home, and run one of these and go home, make that little triangle, uh, leave and go up, go out and come home. But by the time I do that, I'm losing a lot of money. So people ask about uh, backhauls. I hate that word, backhaul. Uh, they're reloads, fuel, truck parts. Everything costs the same everywhere. The brakes should be the same on all of it. That's my personal opinion, and I'm sticking to it. But backhaul um seeing as how that's the terminology everybody knows and it's also what's on a lot of paperwork to me they don't pay enough especially if you get into hauling used units you go somewhere oh yeah this is going to pay x amount well that's not bad i can run right up there and pick that and you go up there half the lights don't work two flat tires and just it's just not dot legal to go down the road i've gotten into that a couple of times since i started doing this and i said to heck with it i'm not gonna do it you know now, if I were to go to um, Idaho and they had a load picking up 150 or on my way back, 150 miles out of way on my way back, that's going a significant way back across the country where I can see I come out, I don't mind doing that, but I can't just run up and go get one, take it 150 miles just to make good with the dispatch. I can't afford it. You know, I would love to. Yeah, you know, I'd love to be one of those drivers that did favors a lot. I can't afford it. My banker won't allow me to do it. And if it comes down to, you know, anybody else or the banker, the banker, I'm going to make the banker happy first because he stands behind me when I need him, you know. So, uh, so can you make money? That's, it, it, you know, that's another thing I was thinking about earlier. It, there's a lot of different people drive a lot of different ways. I've been running like this for, you know, 15 years or better, you know, especially since I have my own truck. You know, I, I try to hustle. I've not been hustling in the past couple days. Anyway, I try to hustle. And uh, when I say hustle, I'm not talking about speeding and overrunning my logbook. I'm talking about not wasting a whole lot of time. Um, past couple of days, I've wasted quite a bit of time. I've had a, I was in a funk from last week. But uh, 
if you're going to get out and you're going to run your 10, 11 hours and shut down, get up, run your 10, 11 hour shut down, I think, I don't see why you wouldn't make money. I don't see why you wouldn't be okay. But if you're going to drive and stop at every, if you're going to be a tourist more than a driver, yeah, you're probably not going to make any money. You know, that, that is the hardest question for anybody to ask. You know, someone, you know, it's like someone, if whatever you're doing currently, if I come up and said, hey, if I come over there and work with you, can I make can I make X amount of dollars a week? Well, I didn't tell you that I smoke, you know, three packs of cigarettes a day and that, you know, I'm fig I am figuring that in. You're not, but I am, you know. And all the, you know, everybody's situation is, is different and like I say, it's a super hard question to answer because I don't want to tell you, absolutely, you can make money, you know, and expect, in my mind, you're going to come over and you're going to run like I run, you're going to run the directions I run. So I can honestly sit here and say, I don't see why you couldn't bring home 2,500 plus a week before taxes, before, you know, that's where the, but then I get, you know, then you come over and uh, it takes you seven days to run to California and get back. You're not going to clear that, you know really hard question to answer um, but I hope I do enough to help you know that's what the videos are for is to help you know. next question uh, the first things you need to get started you need everything you need to be DOT inspected mud flap triangles fire extinguisher and uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, there's something else, but it's not ringing a bell. Uh, the mud flaps have, you know, that's a company thing. That's not really DOT as far as I know. That's a company requirement. But either way, and that's why I say it depends on the company that you go with. Some companies are going to require stuff, other companies are not. Um, so... After that, after the DOT inspection, once you figure out what you got to have for that and you get past that. My first thing, one of my first top things on my list, the window shades, the, the WeatherTech window shades, because you're not going to rest good if the lights are coming in blinding you. If you're planning on sleeping in a truck now, I, and I'll tell you this, as far as can I make money, if you're going to stay in a hotel room and eat steak dinners every night, you're, you're not going to make any money. You, you, you're, you're going the wrong direction. Um, you may break even. I'm not saying you can't break even and see the country if you're semi-retired and that's what you want to do, then hey, go for it. But if you're like me and actually depending on this money that comes in from this and you need to squeeze, it, it, it's more about how much money you can save than how much you can make because you can make all the money in the world, but if you can't save any money, you're not going to get ahead. Um, so, yeah, the, the window shades, you'll sleep so much better knowing the, you can't see the see the stuff going on on the outside and people can't just sit there and look in on you while you're sleeping it just gives you a it just it really helps out that that's one thing that I won't do the job without is one of the shades they're like a hundred and they're between a hundred and 150 bucks I don't know they may be different on the trucks but I know mine were between a hundred and 150 and I will buy them again instantly. Uh, the next thing would be you're going to have to have a weight distribution hitch. And that would probably come over the window shades, but they're right there close together. Those would be the first two things that I bought. You don't have to have a fifth wheel starting off. I pull, I don't mind pulling my pull shredders even though I've got a fifth wheel. Um, they seem to be a little bit easier on the truck. The fifth wheel definitely rides better. But most of the time, especially if you get the small bumper pulls, there was an older gentleman when I first started. He told me if I wanted to make money to, uh, first off, never drive over 65 mile an hour. It gets into fuel mileage and it wears and tears harder on your truck. Second thing, stay away from the big trailers. It doesn't matter that they have a big rate on them. Stay with the smaller trailers because you're going to make it up in fuel and you're going to make it up in maintenance and wear and tear on your truck. I believe that. Now, it's hard when you see the big massive fifth wheel sitting there with a giant rate, you know, with a bigger rate, the giant fifth wheel with a bigger rate going somewhere, you know, it's, it's hard to turn that down and I have an issue with that, but I, I have a hard time doing that. But, um, the weight distribution hitch, 
the window shades, and a fuel tank. Those will be my first three priorities, as far as I know. To the best of my, what I'm thinking right now, that would be my first three thoughts. So, anyway, I'm trying to think if I'm missing anything. I feel like I've been rambling, and I probably have. Like I said, my, 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 my mood has not been the best this, this past week, and it's kind of helped out a little bit just setting the cruise on 65 and just riding. My friends are joking on me because it's taking me so long to get back. I don't care. Um, I'm just taking some time and just having a relaxing trip back after the week out, you know. And as far as the dent in a truck, it could have been worse. I don't know many people who's actually done that that hasn't lost their back window. I don't know anyone who's done it that didn't, didn't damage the trailer, you know. So I'm, I feel blessed. I feel like it was worked out the best possible way that it could, even though it should not have happened because I should have been watching closer. But I'm not going to sit here and beat myself up over it. I'm going to look at that den every time I go to get in the truck. I'm going to think, well, I'm not going to do my best not to let that happen again. So, guys, I hope I'm answering questions. I hope I'm hitting things i feel like like i said i feel like i've been rambling but it's a lot easier for me to try to add this in like this than to text back you know because most most of the time if i'm responding if you text me and i text you back through instagram or snapchat or something like that, or a comment it can fall through the cracks it happens because i don't pick up my phone and start texting back whenever I'm driving down the road. I wait until I stop for fuel. I wait until I stop just to get out and stretch my legs or I stop and wait until I stop like tonight and go to bed for the night. So if you don't hear right back from me, you know, that that's just part of it. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting until I get to a safe spot where I can actually, actually concentrate and think and give you a good answer back. And this is just better for me to do it this way. Anyway, I hope I answered some questions. I hope everyone's doing good. I hope that any veterans that are watching had uh, had a good Veterans Day and thank you for your service. Um, a lot of us appreciate it a lot more than we know how to how to convey. But all right, guys, I'm going to bed.